Good morning. I am Frank Gavin, the director of the Robert S. Strauss Center for International Security and Law, and we are very, very excited to get this day started. Uh, I think we're all uh, we're quite thrilled with the wonderful setting last night, the beautiful weather, the great camaraderie, the building of networks. Well, today is the day we put you to work to pay for all that. So we are very, very excited. Um, it's with great pleasure that I welcome all of you to the second annual assembly of the Next Generation, uh, Next Generation Texas Assembly. You have been selected as a fellow because of your talent, your drive, your unique perspective, and your demonstrated willingness to think creatively about our most pressing policy challenges. What we do in the Next Gen Texas program is provide the forum for sharp, innovative, but respectful debate and discussion. The assembly process that you will be going through today is a time-tested one, as Admiral Inman told us about last night. It was perfected by the American Assembly, a nonpartisan po policy platform created by Dwight D. Eisenhower during his time as president of Columbia University. You will break up into two groups. Each will be overseen by two very experienced moderators with carefully crafted questions and readings that are uh, set up to spur discussion and debate. We want your best ideas expressed respectfully. We are also interested in long-term thinking, not snap responses. We believe that the best ideas are rarely conventional or partisan, but emerge from insightful, creative debate and bringing smart people together. That's what we're doing here today. And we're very excited to see all of you uh, here with us today and Saturday. <laughs> now, what motivates this year's questions and themes? As you know, last year we had a very successful meeting on energy and the environment. I learned an extraordinary amount. It, the timing for it could not have been better. We were clearly at a moment where uh, fundamental issues in energy and environmental policy were shifting. And we had some of the smartest people, some of the leading edge people telling us about it and talking about uh, these things and crafting these things and all sorts of really good uh, networks, collaborations, uh, friendships emerged from that. Why did we pick the topic we picked today? It's obviously a little bit risky. Uh, we're talking about politics and policy writ large. And we're just a few days away from a very important election. And as we all know, at the presidential level, the candidates are virtually deadlocked. And one of the things they always tell you in these things is bring up any topic, but don't bring up politics. <laughs> we decided to go in a little bit of a different direction. Now, why did we do this? Well, we believe that the outcome of this election uh, will have critical and lasting effects on the most important, consequential policy issues of the day. And we thought it would be interesting to ask, what role does Texas play in all this? What effect will Texas have on the election, and what effect will the election have on the state? Now, at first glance, this may seem like a misplaced question. I don't think anyone in the room doubts the outcome of Texas's vote, and the political orientation of the state at this present moment hardly seems in doubt. But it did strike us, for a lot of reasons, that Texas matters, and it matters a lot. And there are four reasons, sort of, I think, that and there are probably many more reasons, but four reasons that, that I'd like to suggest to you why Texas is ex thinking about these questions and thinking about Texas and the national political scene is extraordinarily important. First, Texas's economic and political performance over the past 10 or so years is a matter of great debate. There's essentially two binary views here, and as is often the case with binary views, the truth probably lies somewhere in the middle, but you know how the debate goes. There are those who argue that the Texas economic and political model is the one that best weathered the Great Recession and provides the best hope for long-term growth through low taxes, a business-friendly setup, uh, and a environment that makes uh, it easy for people and companies to move here. And then the big question comes, if this is the case, should other states, should other part of the country emulate this? And you saw in some of the readings, particularly in the famous or infamous, depending on who you are, uh, economist cover from three summers back about the Texas model versus the California model. There are others who disagree vehemently and see the Texas model as fundamentally unsound, underinvesting in education, infrastructure, and healthcare, and promoting inequality, ignoring or leaving aside the most vulnerable. 
Now we hear echoes of this debate or these questions in the national debate, particularly on the key issue of what is the proper role of government in economic and sociocultural life. Understanding what the real Texas story is, both today and in the last decade, and even further past in history, we believe is important to assess the role in answering this question in the national debate. Second big reason Texas matters is the demographic changes that Texas uh, is going through. Texas and its changes and its shifts reflect much of what we believe and many believe will be happening in most of the rest of the country, a population that is getting younger and more ethnically diverse. The questions surrounding immigration and a more ethnically diverse population are ones Texas has been thinking about for some time. Are there lessons there for the rest of the country? Does Texas's history provide a roadmap uh, or any possible lessons or clues for how we should handle this question? Third, though Texas is large, I think we'd all agree that it hits above its weight in political matters, at least recently. Whether it's the U.S. House or Senate or even the presidency, Texans have played a large role in the modern American political history, especially since World War II, and no doubt will in the future. Who are the future political leaders? What will they bring to the nation? Uh, might the political debates that are happening in Texas right now or in the next five or ten years be the same ones that the nation will be having, or are they, or will they be different? Um, one of the questions that animates a lot of our discussion will be how unique Texas is, or how much is it a model for the rest of the country? And the political question is a key one. Finally, I think as every Texan knows, we have an outsized reputation, both in the country and around the world. This is something that Jack Martin's going to be talking about tonight, hopefully, as he took over the global company Hill and & Knowlton and has gone around uh, the country. And I think I was talking to someone who worked for him and people as he goes to Singapore and Paris and, and Rio, and people say, oh my god, I'm working for a Texan, right? <laughs> and so this, we, we all have a sense of this reputation. There are good sides to this reputation, right? Uh, great entrepreneurship, as reflected in uh, people like the Brumleys and, and our guest George C. Uh, great kindness, uh, entrepreneurship, innovation, independence. But we also know there's a uh, a less favorable side of this mythology, a less favorable uh, side to this national and international uh, reputation, a less kind picture. What is the right version? Much of what Texas is and is not, both past, present, and future, is misunderstood, wrapped in myth, and often plain wrong. We thought that before grappling with Texas's problems and opportunities, we needed a better sense of what Texas actually is. Who is Texas? What is Texas? Where has it been? And where is it going? One thing that is clear from the readings, the one thing that you can say about Texas is Texas is change. Texas constantly goes through transformations and change. If you look at the statistics, if you look at the articles that were provided, the Texas of 1970, even 1990, is nothing like the Texas of 2012, and therefore it's fair to assume that the Texas of 2020 or 2025 will be much different than the one we live in today. The changes are profound. Economically, politically, demographically, Texas is a place that is in constant movement. And given how important Texas is and will continue to be, understanding where we are as a state and where we were going will be important not just for understanding our own local and regional problems, but if you accept my argument that Texas matters for the nation, uh, for getting a better sense of where the country is going. So these are the important pressing questions that we put before you today and tomorrow. To get these discussions off the ground, we've put together a discussion between two terrific experts, uh, Victoria Del Francesco Soto and George C. This conversation will be moderated by our very own Will Inboden, a professor at the LBJ School and a distinguished scholar at the Strauss Center. In addition to being, a, being an award-winning historian uh, and an award-winning teacher as well, Will has over a decade of important government service, including a stint as the Senior Director of Strategy for the National Security Council. He also built and led the Legatum Institute uh, in London. And I was thinking, Will, of you with the new Prosperity Index that just came out this week and how so many of the, which Will invented and how so many of the questions that we're going to be dealing with actually are 
related to some of the questions that went into the prosperity index that you created. And I can think of no one better to start us off on a great day of discussion, debate, and learning than our very own Will Inboden. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Frank, and uh, in turn, it'll be uh, my privilege to introduce our two uh, keynote panelists uh, for, for this morning to get the, get the day's conversations going. Uh, by way of uh, brief background and where I uh, come, come to this juncture, I'm a relative newcomer to Texas, as Frank mentioned, uh, but I did work in Washington, D.C. For, for a number of years in national politics, and I found myself on multiple occasions there working for Texans uh, in the congressional leadership, in the White House, and so as a non-Texan, I felt like I got significant and exposure to Texas's, again, outsized influence on national and international policy. I suppose you could say eventually I realized if I keep working for Texans, maybe I should move to Texas. So, um, so here I am. I'm um, glad you did. Well, thank you. So, uh, so it's my privilege to be moderating our discussion this morning with two very, uh, very distinguished and, and thoughtful and experienced panelists, uh, while still youthful, and I'm sure their best years are uh, line, line ahead of them. So, in the spirit of the next gen, um, uh, uh, how we're going to structure it this morning is. I'll introduce our two panelists. Each one will share uh, a few minutes of introductory prefatory comments. Then I'll have a structured discussion with them on, on a few questions. Then we're going to turn it over to you. Uh, we're going to welcome thoughtful, uh, erudite, uh, winsome questions from the audience. And since I know a lot of you, and since I'm a professor, if I'm not seeing questions, I'm going to call on you. So, um, so drink that coffee if you're feeling a little, uh, little foggy from last night's introductory revelry. Uh, so uh, to, to our panelists, uh, the first one to my immediate left is Victoria De Francesco Soto. Uh, she's a colleague of mine at the LBJ School, really one of America's uh, most distinguished rising public intellectuals. Uh, she's got a PhD from Duke. She regularly uh, appears on MSNBC, on Fox, on NPR. She writes regularly for, for CNN. And one of her abiding intellectual passions is bringing the insights of the academy to uh, a bro broader audience. Um, and she's an acute observer of Texas and national politics. I might say to bring a little bit of partisanship here that Victoria and I are both natives of Arizona. So I don't know what this says that you have two Arizonans uh, talking about Texas politics, but we've been warmly welcomed by your state, so thank you for that. Uh, and you can see uh, more detail in her on her bio in, in your folder. Then uh, uh, to Victoria's left, uh, on the end there is George C. Uh, George is a George is it fifth or seventh generation? Seven. Texas? Seventh generation yeah. Texas. 1819. 1819, okay. So, um, so. And he is proud of it, and suitably so. Uh, anyway, uh, George. Wouldn't you uh, be? Yeah. So George, for his for his day job, is the C CEO of uh, Annandale Capital in Dallas, uh, an international uh, uh, international investment and money management firm. Uh, but George is one of those people who probably hasn't had a good night's sleep in about 20 years, because other than his day job, he's involved in many policy and philanthropic uh, activities uh, across Texas, across the nation, across the globe, and really a leading force in Texas and national politics uh, as, a, as a thinker, as an organizer, as, as, a, as a leader, as a, as a developer. Um, and so he also is uh, very well positioned to give us some, some thoughtful observations on the state of Texas politics as it relates to the nation. So uh, Victoria, why don't we go with you first and um, hear your introductory thoughts and we'll go with George. So, all right. <clears throat> Thank you, Will. Um, and good morning. It is my pleasure to be here. I mean, I get to come and speak to you about my favorite subject politics. Um, three days from the election, I'm not going to lie, I have been losing sleep myself. I'm so excited about this. Uh, and in getting started, uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself so you know where I'm coming from when I'm looking at where Texas has been throughout the years and also where it stands in the constellation of larger U.S. politics. Uh, so I was trained as a political scientist, so I look at American politics, especially campaigns and elections, um, political psychology, kind of from a big aggregate view, looking, looking at it from the 30,000 foot level. Uh, and then on the personal side, I, um, in my adult life I've been a bit of a gypsy. So I grew up in southern Arizona, and then I went to grad school in the south, and then I did some fellowships in the Northeast, and then I got a job in the Midwest, and then I married a Texan. So, you know, I've just had all of these different regional experiences. So while I've been able to look at the larger um, DC national level context, I've been able to see the idiosyncrasies at the local level, and Texas is unique. I mean, I've, I've, I feel like I've seen it all, and when I moved here, um, 
I, I think I knew it intellectually and historically in being a student of, of history and especially um, the history of Texas with relation to um, being a Spanish territory, then a Mexican territory, and then having its own sovereignty, and then the U.S. territory. So I got that, but, but still, it was striking. And I think that Texas, within the general Western ethos of self-reliance, stands out. And in thinking about this ethos of self-reliance, I believe that Texas is a trendsetter. Regrettably, at the national level, we have seen increasing stalemate. Nothing is happening in DC. I, I mean, it is at a standstill. And we've seen this stalemate coming for a while, but I think the last four years have really crystallized the stalemate. So what happens is states have to take over. States have to become more active because nothing is getting done at the federal level. And uh, I think we saw that in 2010. We saw a lot of state level activity, but this is something that was old hat for Texas. So I think Texas really was setting the pace. And again, you know, historically and culturally, dating back to the early 1800s, whether you were part of the Spanish government or the Mexican government or the US government, you were so geographically far from the centers of power that you had to make it on your own. In terms of the next two to four years, I, I do not know. I wish I had a crystal ball and could tell you who's going to win on Tuesday. I really have no idea. It is neck and neck. But regardless of who does win, I think we're in for more stalemate at the national level. If President Obama is reelected, uh, he is going to have the same congressional makeup. If Governor Romney is elected, he is going to have a Democratic Senate, or at the very least, um, he's not going to have the two-thirds in the Senate of Republicans. So we're going to see stalemate again. And Texas is such a model of being able to get things done. You know, the, the Texas le legislative sessions have their drama. And 2011 <laughs> saw its fair share of drama. And this was my, my first year in Texas. And it was, it was like a Mexican soap opera. You know, I just, <laughs> wow. Uh, but it gets things done. However, a, a word of caution and something I worry about is that there are perhaps seeds of DC style stalemate in Texas if we're not careful. Because of the dominance, the one party dominance, and this goes regardless of Democrats or Republicans, but because of that large one party dominance, the super majority that the Republican party holds in Texas, it's not necessarily engaging the minority party. And it's not going to happen for a while, but it will happen. The Democratic Party will start to gain seats again. And the speed of that is going to determine on the outreach efforts that the Republican Party decides to take with Latinos, the fastest growing population in Texas. But regardless, you know, whether it's on the slow pace or the fast pace, Democrats will gain seats. And what happens then? Are we going to see stalemate because there's resentment from the previous minority party of how they were treated during the time of the super majorities. And so I think this is what we need to think about going forward. Uh, I like to think of the time um, while George W. Bush was governor. And I think that was exemplary of bipartisanship. So to keep that in mind is a model going forward. And, and it's tempting. You know, hey, you're the winner. You, you just you want to take it all. But keep in mind that the pendulum swings in politics. Uh, so these are my institutional and political ramblings. I just want to briefly finish up by talking about two issue areas, uh, education and business. And we don't tend to think of them together. You know, the, the teachers and the chamber of folks crowd doesn't usually run together. But they're intimately related. Uh, we think of Texas on a global scale, and the first thing that pops up is it's extremely business friendly. Uh, you know, no income tax, um, great infrastructure. I mean, if you're driving, say, from Arizona to Texas, and you drive through New Mexico, you get it like, oh, these are bad roads. And then you get to Texas, and you breathe a sigh of relief. Texas has that. But on the other hand, the educational infrastructure is lacking. 
And I'm not just saying this because I'm biased and I'm an educator myself, but I'm saying it from a business standpoint, from an investment standpoint. Just like you're going to invest in raw materials, we need to see a greater investment. Um, it may be a greater upfront cost, but in the long run, it's what's going to keep Texas competitive. We are no longer a manufacturing society where you could maybe finish 10th grade or maybe get your high school diploma and get a good paying job at the factory. That doesn't happen anymore. We're talking about technology. We're talking about service industry that requires an educated workforce. And Texas is not just competing with other states. We're competing <coughs> with the world. And so in thinking about these issue areas, we need to have a long-term horizon of the costs and benefits of our human capital here in Texas. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. All right, George. Well, I want to thank Celeste and Frank and Will for having me this morning. It's great to see all you all up here bright and early and everybody looks very alert, ready to go. I don't quite feel alert, ready to go, but I'm here, so it's nice to be here. And I'm sure glad the Brumleys are here. Um, I went out with John's daughter, Carla, a few times in college, and John still likes me, so I must have done something right. So, and John and my father were fraternity brothers at the University of Texas, so when you've been in Texas a long time, it's back to the one or two degrees of separation. You tend to bump into people a lot, and you realize very early on in life, don't burn your bridges. Keep your bridges in place with everyone that you like and respect. Um, I had two thoughts just as an, an intro as everyone else was talking. The first one was, I don't know how many of y'all have heard of William Wilberforce. Anybody raise your hand, heard of William Wilberforce? A handful. He was the preeminent force abolishing the slave trade in Britain 215 years ago. He spent his 40-year career in Parliament railing against slavery and the slave trade and ended every speech he made in Parliament with, I think slavery must die or something along those lines. And his two great crusades were that and the, what he called the Reformation of Manners. And what he meant by that was civility in civil discourse and in public discourse and in private discourse. In other words, treat the person you're engaging with, whether it's in a public setting or in a private se setting, with a great deal of respect and, and attention to what they have to say. We have lost that so dramatically in our culture and society today, and it is a huge loss for serious people, people who want to think deep thoughts and think not just about politics, which I have a keen interest in as well, but about public policy. Because at the end of the day, uh, politics is the bling bling of public life and policy is the substance and what actually changes lives and gets things done for people. And when I see people screaming at each other on talk shows or at getting into ad hominem attacks or, or things like that from the right or the left, I'm just appalled. And to me, if you raise your voice or yell at someone or interrupt them or are rude, you've already lost the argument because you're much more interested in what you have to say and in defeating them in an argument than you are in making a valid point on an issue. And I would challenge you all to, to think about that as you engage with people, both that you agree with and that you disagree with in, in your lives. Texas. Texas is a subject I've kind of gotten sucked into over the years just because of heritage and roots and passion and interest in travel. I've been all over the state in my life. I know the state well. I know what's going on in the state. Well, I was kind of right there at the formation when the last great depression in Texas crystallized into the greatest economic boom we've ever seen in this state ever, even more than the great oil and gas booms of the 30s, 40s, and, and, and uh, 70s. Um, in the late 80s, many of you all will not recall, we really had a depression down here. Real estate, banking, oil and gas, agriculture, they all crashed together. and. Careers were destroyed, lives were wiped out, families were, were divided. It was a really hard time in Texas. It, it was a depression. The rest of the country didn't see it. We used to have a bumper sticker in, in the 80s, uh, leave your light on and, or burn your gas and freeze out a Yankee or something like that because we, we basically were smug about how well we were doing. And then the North had its come up and see against us because we suffered for several years. And I, I got to see then Governor William P. Clements Jr. and his successors uh, George W. Bush and Richards to a lesser extent, but uh, basically build the infrastructure that led to the Texas we have today in close partnership with the business community. At that point, the political community and the business community walked in lockstep and got a lot done. And it was really fun to watch and then see the fruits of that 10, 15, 20 years later, which most people really don't understand or appreciate. We, we are ascendant right now. No matter how you look at it, Texas leads the nation. We're the second largest state 
geographically, population-wise, and our economy is exploding. You can't drive around Dallas-Fort Worth or Houston and not notice the traffic patterns getting tighter and tighter and tighter and it getting more and more difficult to get around because so many people are moving to this state and there just isn't the infrastructure to support it. So I would like to talk this morning briefly before we get into a discussion about what we focus on as Texas. You heard the old hockey expression or the soccer expression, don't be where the puck is or where the ball is, be where the puck or the ball is going to. You want to be ahead of where the trends are or where things are going. And I, I would really agree with the proposition that we need to be forward thinking and thinking what lies ahead in the future. And I would say after almost 20 years of Republican utter domination of our state government and state politics, we're pretty fat and lazy at the political side. And actually the business, economic, and civic leadership of this state is what really runs this state. State government is a factor. It's important. How we spend our tax dollars is very important. But we've gotten fat, lazy, and happy in, in, our, in our political system and in our political leadership in this state. People have been around Austin too long. They're too comfortable there, and they're more concerned about getting reelected or pushing ideological concerns than they are getting something done. So what I, I would agree earlier comments about the integration between education and the business community. You don't educate our people, we're going we're gonna to hit a, hit a wall here pretty quickly. And our education system from primary to secondary to undergraduate to graduate, <coughs> graduate education is at risk right now. You look at California, and California went from top 10 in their primary and secondary schools to bottom 10 in a generation. We're there right now. Our primary and secondary schools are excellent for a state of our size. They're still very, very good. You look at it statistically, there is very little correlation between how much you spend and the quality of education you get. Of course money helps and you've got to have some money, but there is almost no correlation. It, it, there's a lot of other factors that make that up. But how we spend our money, how we educate our kids is critical at those levels. And we've got to take it to the next level. We can't be satisfied where we are. The same thing at our university educations, our flagship universities, UT, A&M, which are under siege right now. A lot of political discourse on that, not much policy discussion. We've got to take those universities to the next level. We need to be where the University of California system is. UVA, Michigan, thank, state universities of that magnitude, we're not there in the national spotlight. We need to move to that next level, not get dragged down into a discussion of budgets and who's effective and who's not and all those sorts of things. So I, I would propose to you that we really need to be focused going forward on substantive policy that affects our state. Education, Medicaid and health care, because that's going to overwhelm our state budget at some point very, very quickly. Most people don't understand that. And then the other pressing needs we have in our state, water policy. We passed a Bush water policy in 1997 and we never funded it. We desperately need a strategic, long-term, well thought out water policy in this state. The drought we just had points that out decisively. And infrastructure. Our infrastructure cannot support the commerce and the people that are coming into this state. And infrastructure, especially roads, are the arteries of our body commerce. The arteries get clogged, the body gets sick. And you can't be in a major city or on major highways in the state without noticing what a problem we have there. You're not going to hear much of this talk in the political discourse. You're going to hear all this. I'm a conservative, admittedly, but you're going to hear all this right-wing haranguing about spending and taxes and everything else. And on the left, you're going to hear all this, you're, you're not doing enough for the poor and you're not spending enough money. We need more taxes and you're being, uh, you're being uh, pie in the sky and, and, and you're not doing the right thing for the state. There's a great, more than a granule of truth in both these positions, but they're caricatures of what we really need to do. The truth is, with how few dollars we have and how much the budget has been cut and scraped and polished, we've cut almost all the fat out of our state budget. We're, we're almost down to the muscle at this point. I'm all for no new taxes, not raising taxes, and limiting spending. However, all those things I just mentioned are going to require some spending, and they're going to require some very, very hard choices in terms of what you put money into and what you don't put money into. And politicians are not set up to make hard decisions. They want to duck the hard decisions and they want to play to the base so they get reelected. That's the whole game right now. And serious people need to have a serious debate about what government's role is going forward and how we spend our money. I'll close with this because I've probably gone on too long. I'm an Anglophile. I love England. And the English have kind of a viewpoint that the well-rounded man or woman doesn't just engage in one particular activity or, or knowledge base. They engage in as many as they can. The arts, sociology, commerce politics, 
uh, writing and literature, um, foreign policy, on and on and on. There's about seven or eight great disciplines that, that the well-read or well-knowledge man or woman should be versed in all of. And politics was kind of viewed as a subsidiary skill set or kind of a little demeaning, just like commerce was. And that, that's kind of silly. But we need to be well-rounded in our viewpoints going forward if this state is to rise to the level it, it should rise to. And make no mistake, Dallas and Houston are now international cities and great international cities. And we all need to be thinking about going to where the puck's going to be, taking this state to the next level, not being smug and content about where we are right now, which is the, which is the preeminent viewpoint in the state currently. Okay, Will? Thank you. <clears throat> so a uh, question for both George and Victoria. At the national level, there's a lot of discussion, a lot of concern about <laughs> splits and tensions within each major party. With the Republicans, the tensions between the social and economic conservatives or between the Tea Party uh, on the right and the moderates. Uh, likewise, with the Democrats, sometimes uh, you know tensions between the moderates and the liberals or between some of the unions and some of the entrepreneurial class or uh, some of the different uh, you know e ethnic groups. My question for each of you, Victoria, Vicki, if you could speak to the Democrats, and George, if you could speak to the Republicans, how do you see those tensions within each party playing out in Texas? Is Texas going to be a, a leading indicator of, uh, of trends within the parties of how these factions are reconciled, or is Texas going to be a leading indicator maybe of uh, future gridlock within each party, which of course makes it harder to work with, with the other party? How do, you, how do you see Texas either leading or lagging the nation there on those tensions? So Vicki, if you could talk about the Democrats. Yeah, I, I think... Uh in the scope of Texas, the Democrats' inner tensions take second place to the fact that they're just trying to get a foothold in. Hmm. Uh, so it, I think once they start to get some traction, then you're going to start to see the infighting. But um, on a general level, you do see um, those internal differences. And it's very interesting to see it regionally, because a Texas Democrat is going to be very different than, you know, a, a Democrat from Massachusetts. Um, I remember I was um, having a discussion with someone about um, climate and energy, and it was this very, very, very progressive Democrat. And I said, "Oh, but, but the climate." I said, "Okay, that's the, I, I get it." But what about the jobs? You know, especially if you've driven down to, to South Texas where the, the, the gas shale boom and you see all these people just lining up in trailers and, and getting jobs, and sometimes you lose the human face of that. So um, more than the, the internal divisions, I see regional divisions. And in Texas, um, as the party grows and the institutional context for the Democratic Party strengthens, that's going to be a challenge for them because if they really want to make a stand in Texas, they have to be unified and not let themselves get fractured. <laughs> Um, the Democratic Party of Texas is DEAD, -E dead, dead, dead right now. Um, that will not uh, change soon, but it may change later. And it all depends on one demographic group, the Hispanic population, which is minority majority in the state right now and will eventually be majority majority in the state. There was a poll that came out yesterday that had Romney uh, behind in the Hispanic vote in Texas 49 to 40. Nationally, he's behind about 70 30. So the Hispanic voting populace in this state is categorically different than in California, New Mexico, other areas of Colorado, other regions of the country. If Republicans gather more than 40% of the Hispanic vote going forward, you can forget about Democrats ever winning anything in this state for the next 20 years. But the trend is the opposite. The trend is Hispanics vote Democrat, and if they start voting in the numbers they're here in, we will have a purple state within 10 or 15 years here. So um, back to the core of te why Texas matters. I think Texas is at the absolute center of the universe politically, because without Texas, Republicans cannot prosper nationally. Tensions within the Republican Party. The Tea Party, which is, pr is predominantly made up of libertarians, is very, very fiscally conservative doesn't want government to be anything but tiny, doesn't want to spend any money, doesn't want any new taxes, and it's pretty, a, a large enough piece of them are just angry about everything. <laughs> now, there's a lot of very fine Tea Party members, I respect their positions, but um, there's less proactive, what can we do that's good for Texas, and there's more, of, I'm, there's, a, there's an old man in the old days named Eddie Childs, who none of you remember, but he put up TV, TV ads, John remembers him, saying, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. And, and anyway, he, he didn't like all the government work either. So you have that on the Tea Party libertarian side. And then on the social conservative side, you have deep religious faith undergirding positions on social issues and on public policy from a Republican standpoint. And these two groups don't mesh. Most libertarians and Rand Atlas Shrugged, they're very suspicious and sometimes even very hostile to religious people. 
So these are two very key bases of the Republican Party, and they really don't see eye to eye except on fiscal conservatism. I'm involved in a very, very significant outreach to the Hispanic community on a William Wilberforce civil, polite, don't you have a lot of common ground with conservatives when you really get down to it, discourse, both through TV, radio, media, and town hall meetings that has been very gratifying and fun. But those um, particular tensions are, it, it's back to what Vicki said a little while ago, if, if, if you've got everything, you start fighting amongst themselves, and they, then you start sowing the seeds of your, of your downfall eventually, so. Well, uh, George, since, especially since you brought up the, uh, the Hispanic vote, and Vicki, this is something I know you've uh, thought a lot about and worked a lot on. This was actually my next question to both of you is, uh, what do you see as the future of the, the Hispanic community within Texas in, in terms of its political alignments, uh, especially as at least uh, you know, the, the Democrats certainly have uh, more support from them currently. There's some Republicans, such as George, actually leading outreach uh, efforts to the to the Latino community. Uh, could the Latino community really, right now, if you compared to its numbers, it probably has less influence. But could it become a disproportionate, uh, disproportionately strong influence uh, for for both parties? And what will it take for uh, Democrats to maintain the Latino vote and Republicans to perhaps woo it woo it over to their side? So, uh, so Latinos make up about 70% of the population nationally. However, about half of that, and it varies by state, um, are documented and then within those eligible to vote. So even though um, the Latino population is large and growing, we have to keep in mind the reality of it that regrettably, Latinos don't vote at the numbers they should be. So when I see projections, um, you know, like Jeb Bush saying that uh, in four years, uh, Texas is gonna go blue, I'm like, that's crazy. But it is going to happen. The Latino political crowd will grow, but it's going to take a couple of decades for it to be commensurate with, say, um, the African American vote or the white vote. So putting that aside, we are at a critical junction with regards to Latinos. So uh, Latinos excluding Cuban Americans, and I'm going to bracket them for, the, for a minute, and if we want to talk about them later, we can, but have traditionally voted democratically, but at the same time, uh, we saw that George W. Bush and Karl Rove uh, made a very good uh, connection, I would say, with the Latino party. And not just in campaigning, I mean, they were brilliant in terms of the, the, the campaign effort they put forward, but even within the administration, they did have a lot of sensibility for Latino issues, for example, immigration and education. And Latinos are not overwhelmingly conservative. That's a conventional wisdom. About half of Latinos uh, approve of gay marriage, half don't. So it's just like the general population. But right now, going forward, if the Republican Party doubles down on its anti-immigrant rhetoric, and not that all Latinos only care about immigration, but it's a gateway issue. So if I sense that you are being um, negative toward immigrants, I'm just gonna shut off and I'm not gonna listen to the rest of what you have to say. If they continue on that, then you're going to have path dependency set in. And you're going to see a greater and greater migration of these new Latinos who are coming of age just default to the Democratic Party. And it's going to be harder to turn that ship, it's like, you know, like the Titanic, to turn it toward the Republican Party, 20, 30 years. Uh, on the flip side, in terms of the Democratic Party um, can't take the Latino vote for granted. And in my personal opinion, it has uh, with regards to immigration reform in particular. And again, I don't think it is the defining issue for immigrants, but President Obama did make a promise about immigration reform and then how he proceeded to deal with that issue throughout his four years I think is problematic. And it would be an in for Republicans, but given the climate of the, the 2012 presidential primary, it was difficult to see any steering toward the Latino community. So we're at a crossroads. If the Republican Party wants to make an effort, now is the time. If they wait longer, it's going to be much, much more difficult. I've got so many statistics on this subject I could throw at you all. I'm, I'm going to try to re restrain myself to some degree. But um, if Latinos had voted in their proportion to the population, 
last election cycle uh, and the way they vote, which is about 67-33 Democratic to Republican um, around the state, Rick Perry's margin of victory in the governor's race would have been 9.5% lower than what it was. Think about that. Let me go back to public policy, which is what I really care about the most. Over 40% of Hispanics drop out of high school. Over 40% of Hispanic births are outside of wedlock. George, is this nationally or in Texas? Texas. Okay. 61% right. of live births in Texas are Hispanic. The future of Texas is Hispanic. It's undeniable. And when you think about Hispanics, you traditionally think of the Valley and El Paso and all those kind of things. That's fine, but the, the Hispanic population in Dallas-Fort Worth and in Houston is larger than the Hispanic population in the Valley. Did you all know that? So it, it affects the entire state big time. And back to George W. Bush, who spoke fluent Spanish and was halfway raised by his Hispanic housekeeper when he was growing up. Um, he is very fond of, of Mexicans and, and Latino people. And he, anybody know which city he went to the most between 1994 and his reelection in 1998? Mexico Any? City? No. Uh, to Mexico. In, in, yeah, in Texas. Oh, in Texas. Uh. Anybody have an idea? Huh? El Paso. El Paso, uh -huh. exactly. By far. He split he won the vote in El Paso. And he, he was a 50-50 candidate in the 1988 election and in the 2004 election almost. He had about 45% of the vote nationally, but he almost split it in Texas with Hispanics. So uh, it can be done. And Hispanics are receptive to a Republican conservative message that is respectful that honors them and their heritage and their, their, their lineage in Texas and talks to them not as if they're a homogeneous voting block, because they're not. Back to what Vicki said, about 85% of Hispanics in Texas are Mexican-American. 15% or so are Cubans, Puerto Ricans, Guatemalans, Brazilians, et cetera. So it's really a dialogue with Mexican-Americans. But you have to respect all them because they're all so different. I mean, Cuban-Americans are their own category completely. Um, this to me is the preeminent issue of our time. And get away from the politics. Let's talk about educating Hispanic Texans, getting great jobs for Hispanic Texans, and making sure Hispanic Texans speak good English. Because let's face it, if you can't speak the English language in this state, you're capped. There's no way you can get above a certain level of economic prosperity for you and your family. So we have to engage on this issue, not just from a political standpoint, but from an economic, educational, and societal perspective. And just so you know, too, two African Americans and six Hispanics were, elect were elected to the te Texas legislature last political cycle. There were zero and zero, respectively, before then. So the Republican Mar Party is making small inroads. Those are still pretty small, but making inroads. Right, thanks. All right. Well, let's uh, let's open it up to the uh, our our next generation fellows now, and, and hear hear from you. So, uh, questions for our our panelists. So, yeah, the hand back there. Okay. Hi, this is David Boucher from IHS Sierra Houston. Uh, you both touched on uh, kind of two uh, interconnected issues, but kind of uh, it's the issue of education and then sort of the demographics. Uh, there's a big Supreme Court case now that involves the University of Texas and kind of using affirmative action. I just wanted to see what, uh, what y'all's views on that were, how it could go, and then what the implications are after Okay. You want to take that one first? Uh, the Fisher case. <clears throat> We need to be very cognizant of the need to educate at all levels um, and at the same time to have that education available um, for all residents. Uh, and when I say all residents, I don't just mean by racial and ethnic makeup, but also of different SES classes. And you know, at this point, and I'm going to plead ignorance on the particulars of admission systems in Texas. You know, if you ask me about Arizona, I can talk about that. Uh, but I would want to understand what the current process is and see who is coming into these classes and also what um, economic opportunities they have. You know, what are the funding structures? Um, is it equitable across regions, um, across SES brackets? And that, to me, should be the guiding concern. And then you can figure out whether it's affirmative action or not affirmative action, or top 5%, top 10%. Um, but in talking about education, it's pre-K through college. Because nowadays, you can't do anything with college. I mean, that's the bare minimum. And I think sometimes we focus so much on primary education. It, it's primary. It's fundamental. But today, 
we also need to throw college into that. It should be pre-K through college and not just pre-K through 12. I, I don't know the particulars of that case. I'm a lawyer, but I quit practicing law about 20 years ago because I hated it with a passion. So I, I, I haven't. Um, <clears throat> but I, I will tell you that from my standpoint, what we need to be focused on as a state is providing the meritorious in this pretty meritoc merit meritocratic meritocracy that we have in Texas, the kind of opportunities people deserve. And, and for me, that comes much more from your background, your community, your, your uh, economic position, and things like that, that from your race, ethnicity, sex, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I, I'm going to half facetiously tell you there might need to be affirmative action for white men. Because uh, you go to the Midwest, I'm, de I'm, I'm half serious about that. You go to the Midwest, and in the last uh, deep recession, college-educated white men had about a 4 or 5% unemployment rate, and non-college-educated white men had about a 15% unemployment rate. Think about the societal implications of that, if these are heads of households and fathers and daddies and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the overwhelming majority of people who go to college are women now. Women are ascendant in our society, and we could probably argue that subject forever, but the majority of law school students are women. The majority of undergraduate students are women. There are incredible opportunities for women out in society. And I would say we have done, a, we could still do a better job, but there are really, really fine opportunities for African American, Hispanic, Asian, other, other ethnic minorities around the state. Can we do better? Of course we can do better, but I'm absolutely not in favor of quotas and set-asides and all that based on your skin color, your background, your ethnicity. I think that should be one factor of maybe 20 when you make an admissions decision, but I'm much more focused on somebody from inner city Houston or rural Alpine or inner city Fort Worth who is completely disadvantaged economically, doesn't have any money to pay for college, and has just busted their tail and is valedictorian of their class and making sure they have every opportunity that some guy in Highland Park or, or, or uh, River Oaks in Houston has. Okay. Other questions? Yes, right here. Good morning, Jessica Mike from Chevron. Um, from listening to both of you talk, I'm hearing a lot about um, the, the growing Hispanic population in Texas and the need to provide opportunities. One statistic that I'm curious to hear is when you talk about this, uh, this next generation and the need to educate, how many of those are U.S. citizens and how many of those, even if they were able to educate, get education, can then get jobs? And so I'm curious what your vision is for Texas when you wrap in the immigration issue and is there a role for Texas to play in that reform? Uh, so when we're talking about <coughs> education, especially at the, the pre-K and the primary school level, we tend to be talking about um, documented folks. So these are the children of either documented or undocumented persons. Uh, so even though maybe 40% in that range in general in Texas, in terms of the Latino population, are undocumented. Um, when it comes to children, they tend to be documented. So uh, that's one issue. Now, I know there's been a lot of talk about the DREAMers and deferred action, and that is an issue uh, that we need to account for You know, here in Texas. So we've spent all this money in Texas educating these kids, whether it was from first grade or from sixth grade on. And then what happens? So I think there needs to be a common sense solution to what do we do with these folks that we've invested so much in, and they want to be productive citizens, and they want to contribute to the growth of Texas. So it's two different baskets that we're talking about. Usually the, the older Latino children um, you know, in their teens, uh, and then the younger folks. Um, there we need to focus on making sure that they have the resources at their schools, that you know they're not in a class with 35 kids, but they're in a class with 25 kids. And then older folks uh, tends to be with, we need an option for them. I just, I just think this is such a critical issue, and obviously immigration policy is a federal issue for the most part, but we in Texas, being the preeminent border state besides California, should have a huge voice on this issue, especially through our elected representatives in Washington. They ought to be screaming about it every day. And to me, at least, rational immigration policy is not that complicated. On the far right, you've got all this build the wall and send them all back to their country's garbage. And on the far left, you've, you've got all this, or I should say left, you've got all this, oh, let's just give them all amnesty and let them be citizens and pay no cost for breaking our laws and they'll all vote for us forever. But those, both those positions are highly offensive. 
uh, in my view. Uh, rational immigration policy has to do with setting up a guest worker program so that people who want to be here to work but don't be, want to become American citizens can go register, we can account for who they are, they can get a job, they can send money back home, and they, they can play out the citizenship issue or return to their, their home country at some future date. And those who do want to become a citizen, they say, I'm here, here I am, I'm going to go to the back of the line because there's other people who've gotten in the line who've done it the right way, and I came in here illegally. I'm going to pay some kind of fine or price for violating the laws of the country I live in, and then I'll have an opportunity to become a citizen if I do X, Y, Z, P, D, Q. And in addition to that, once this group has been registered, no tolerance for those who had a year, year and a half, however long the period is, to register, chose not to do so as long as you get the word out properly, and then employers who continue to hire illegals after this has been put in place and a guest worker program has been in place. Severe penalties, I mean really with teeth, for people who continue to hire illegals to save money, cut costs, and not be fair to the people who are working on that. Um, I've heard it said before there is great relevance in, in sound, wise immigration policy in religious context because religions would basically say you treat people with dignity and honor and respect and kindness. And I think this put up a big wall and send everybody home stuff is unkind, irrational, and nonproductive. And this break laws or break rules without any, any uh, penalty to be paid for that is also really not very wise policy. So the interim would be, and, and this is back to where I think, it, and believe it or not, I'm talking too much, but immigration is the fourth or fifth most important issue among Hispanic voters, if you can believe that. It, I was shocked. I thought it'd be number one. It's down the list. But Hispanics want to be treated with respect on this issue and, and in a civil discourse on it. Back to the civil discourse thing. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Good I'm, a, uh, I'm a student at the, at the University of Texas at the National College Program. Connecting what you were just talking about to the early discussion about politics and political politics in Texas, I mean, how can you, t I mean, Governor Perry took a fairly courageous stance in the Republican primaries and got hammered for it on immigration. Um, how, can you, how can you get to that rational policy in a place with political deadlock? So connecting you know, this discussion of immigration getting what you insist is a pretty simple policy through in Texas and how can we connect it that way? You know, I think that uh, we have seen historically that in times of economic recession that anti-immigrant uh, emotions flare. And we happen to be in the wake of a recession and it was the political context. And we also came on the heels of the Tea Party movement, which has that very extreme, the kind of send them all home, build the wall view. So you add that to the recession, people were feeling strained. And you know, Rick Perry was put into a box. And he made the strategic political move to you know, move away from his immigrant stances. You know, my personal opinion, he should have doubled down. But uh, I think a lot of it just has to do with the context in this, term, in this sense, economic. I, and I'm so glad you brought that up because that, that's a multiple layer of the onion situation. Rick Perry was courageous to do that policy uh, angle here in Texas. I would tell you I disagree with that policy because I don't think it's right to favor an African American female student in Virginia over an illegal, someone here illegally here in Texas in terms of what tuition they pay. I, I, I don't like that. I think that's wrong. Now how Mitt Romney handled that, I think was shameless. I was disgusted that he just hammered Rick Perry when he, Mitt's been all over the map on immigration and he's pandering to the far right right now to secure his base and solidify them. No one is doing a serious discussion on immigration policy that's center, middle of the road and is good for the entire country because they're just pandering to their political basis. And um, make, no, make no mistake, Mitt Romney is a very, very capable, shrewd, smart guy. And unfortunately, he hasn't progressed the level of statesman yet. I think he's trying to do that right now. But he, he shamelessly played to the base to try to eliminate their suspicions of him being a flip-flopper and, and too moderate and all this stuff. And that was a, a perfect example of that. that was, there, was, there just wasn't any substance to that. Uh, that discussion on his part, on Rick's part, there was substance and there was deeply held thought on Rick's part. But Rick, being imperial down here and being in the governor's office too long at this point, basically it was not used to being argued with or questioned on his policies. And he reacted emotionally and, and with outrage, and that was not statesmanlike either. So that was an interesting dialogue. Uh, Rachel, at the back. Uh, my name is Rachel Hoppe. I'm a global policy student at the LBJ School. I lived in Europe during the beginning of the war in Iraq, and um, 
heard a lot about cowboy diplomacy, which for those wearing boots in the room is not intended as a compliment. Wanted dead or alive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you think are the major factors driving or shaping Texas's reputation in the world today, looking forward? Looking forward. Well, I think we are still um, coming off George W. Bush's legacy. Um, in regret, so what happened in, in 2008 and kind of economically and foreign policy-wise. So there's a tarnish there. But I think that as we move forward and, and politics and history progresses, um, the memory connecting Texas to automatically connecting Texas to the American economy and connecting it to foreign policy starts to fade. So I think that you start to have a clean slate and the idea of cowboy politics fades because now you have Obama politics or whatever term you want to label that fresher in the memory. So I think um, political memories are fickle and they tend to fade with time. Um, I do business all over the world, so I, I get to talk to people all over Europe and Asia and Latin America and everything else, and they still view us as a cowboy hick, hat and hat and boots and cattle and da it's TV series Dallas, and they're clueless, to be honest, about Texas and how dynamic this place is and how sophisticated this place is and how this is, is the ascendant power in the United States, this state. The power structure, although there will always be a deep power structure on the East Coast and on the <coughs> Left Coast, it's sucking into Texas and into Florida uh, more and more every day, but especially Texas. And every chance I get to educate someone on that, I do so. It's been interesting because I tried to, to uh, do, a, do a real estate transaction, a large one, with some Russian investors and some Chinese investors, and they were so clueless about Texas. They just focus on the East Coast and California, and they just don't understand. But in the next 10 to 20 years, they will understand. They'll get it, they'll get it eventually, but it will take time, and it's unfortunate. But we've sowed a lot of the seeds of our malaise in terms of reputation around the world, right? Giant. Um, all, the, all the John Wayne stuff, uh, J.R. Ewing, the Kennedy assassination, which Lee Harvey Oswald was from Louisiana for anybody who wants to know about that. <laughs> that that's been a deep, deep wound in Dallas that's finally been lanced and, and healed over. Thank God. It was horrible. Um, but it's a, pro it's a process. Uh, yes, sir. Joanne Young. I'm a, I guess, a new fellow. I work at J.P. Morgan Chase. in Dallas. I'm wondering about when you're talking about the education issue and how to invest in the next generation and how to solve that issue. Um, what we're talking about in the future, we need to invest more. But what about the people right now and the people in the last five years that are getting to that point that are coming into the workforce? Is there discussion or policy proposals around additional investment in vocational training or technology training or um, employers making additional available for those types of people that might not have that solid education that we want to invest in in the future. Just wondering about that. Uh, I, I wouldn't know the particulars of um, any bills that are being filed or looking to be filed, but I would hope that that would be included because when we talk about a education, it needs to be at large. And George earlier brought up an interesting statistic that it's um, many of these white men in the Midwest that have the highest, some of the highest unemployment rates. So I do think that we can't forget certain groups of people just because they're adults, because they are in dire need themselves, they're unemployed, and not only is it themselves, it's families that are counting on them. So I, I think that this is critical to expanding that notion of not just focusing on one element of education, but creating a broad-based educational format for human capital and for retraining human capital. If you think of Medicaid spending as the Pac-Man in the old video game, Medicaid is going to just eat everything else within 20 or 30 years. It's growing so rapidly. So it's a real problem for education spending and infrastructure spending and all the other things that state government should be doing. I, I view any, any investment as spending, and we've got a limited pot to spend from because we have to constitutionally balance our budget. So if you're taking from one area, you're, you're giving to another area, you've got to make good decisions on what you do. I think that we need to be much more efficient in how we spend our money. And I think last session there was a lot of focus on that there were, I believe, more administrators in our, in our primary and secondary school systems than, than teachers. I may be wrong about that, but it was such a large number of administrators, it was very offensive. And then there's been a huge debate, which was on the front cover of Texas Monthly, 
two months ago, I think, about the, the war at UT and A&M that the governor has launched with his minions and that uh, the universities are pushing back on. And that is so counterproductive. Um, yes, the governor and the Texas Public Policy Foundation, which I'm on the board of to acknowledge, have a good point that we waste our spending at our university systems, but to go publicly throw mud balls at our best universities and create this great turmoil and friction and ill will is so unwise. Um, UT, I know for certain, has done a good job identifying places to cut costs and lower spending and reallocate resources to other areas that will be more productive. That is a very, very complicated endeavor and needs to be done in partnership with the university system and state government and the private sector. And right now, everybody's just calling each other names and getting mad at each other. It's so counterproductive. And if you look at the whole strata of university education, I believe we, there's only one thing I'd like to model California on that I think of besides natural beauty, and that's their university system. The California State University system is a work of art. And UT and A&M at the top should be flagships and magnificent places to get an education and extremely elite. And then you start going down the tiers. And what you were talking about earlier, whether it's junior colleges, community colleges, trade schools, we have to allocate resources, time, and energy to this part of the educational system because most people in our state, they're not going to be going to UT or A&M or even tech. No offense to anybody who went to tech here that I mentioned at third. Um, they're going to be going to uh, De DeVry or, or Tyler Junior College. And we got to focus on that layer because those are the layers of the people who are going to come up and provide the new middle class among Hispanics and other people and have enough education to get by in the, in, in the state. And that's under-talked about and under-appreciated. Uh, yes, right here. George, you had said that um, you felt like we needed to spend our money more efficiently through the legislature. Uh, the last session, we did end up cutting $4.5 billion of the biennium to public education. We do have a huge payment coming up at the first part of the 13 session um, related to health care that we're going to have to address. It's like $2.4 billion. But you also said that you don't feel that there's any correlation between money spent and results in public education classroom. And I'm wondering, where do you sort of see the divide? If we're taking money out of the public schools, yet we're still, in, we're still insisting on the standards, what, is it, what else should the state be doing to make sure that if 40% of Hispanics are dropping out, that there are programs in place or an infrastructure in place to help them succeed to get to the next level? Well, that's, there's several questions there, and I'll try to address them. The first one, in terms of Hispanics dropping out, that's, that's a lot more cultural than anything else, because Hispanics are, are very, as a, as, a, as a group, are a very, very, very hardworking group of people, and the parents of a lot of those children are urging them to get out of the school system and stop lollygagging in school and get to work and earn a living for their family. So a lot of that's cultural as opposed to just, I'm going to drop out and go drag race or hang out at a bar or something like that. So there's got to be some cultural implications of, hey, you'll do better long term if you stay in school. Spending, it's been documented over and over and over again in this state through many, many studies that throwing money at a kid's education doesn't have any correlation whether that kid has a good outcome or not. My school district, Highland Park in Dallas, has sent about a billion five to Laredo over the last 20, 25 years since Robin Hood came in. And Highland Park still ranks right at the top of every school system in the state. And it's due to parental involvement, uh, competitiveness within the district, a, a focus on excellence. Yes, you got to have money to do things well, but how you allocate it and how you deal with it is just going to be critical. And back to this thing last time around, eliminating administrative jobs that are just fillers and putting more and more resources into teachers and being in the classroom. I'd like to see us triple the number of Teach for America students that come down in here and teach. We've got a partnership with them that is kind of incubating and is significant in size, but it ought to be tripled or, or quadrupled. So. Um, it's a very complicated, multifaceted problem. And back to the budget really quickly. We only spent a third of the rainy day fund last time around. I think the reason we only spent a third was because this, this biennium is going to be really, really complicated too. But maintaining this huge rainy day slush fund when you have all this, these pressing issues is unwise. We're, we're going to have, huh? You disagree with holding back the rainy day fund in, in 11? Um, no, I don't. I actually agree with it because I think we have other pressing issues coming here in 13 that we're going to have to use it for. I think we should always maintain something in that rainy day fund, but I think we don't have any other choice but to spend a nice significant amount of it this biennium to meet some of the issues you brought up. To, Vicki, go ahead. Just sure. to add on to this, and, and there are cultural issues, so for example, um, younger folks tending to go into the workforce earlier, um, also some gender role differentials. Um, but it also regrettably happens that a lot of Latinos are concentrated in areas that are impoverished. And the areas that are impoverished don't have 
good schools. You know, there, there's this example you cited, but most times the schools don't have outside funding to help subsidize um, their infrastructure. So I think it's that inequitable distribution of funding dollars. So there, there is the issue, and that's a different issue, of just the lump sum that goes into schooling, but it's also how that is distributed. And a lot of times, you know, the good areas get all the good resources and the bad areas. It's, it's a vicious and virtuous cycle. I would add to that in that Robin Hood completely changed a whole lot of that. Seventy percent of Highland Park tax revenues go to Laredo. So, <laughs> you know, you don't have all the really rich districts hoarding all the resources. The state has got a system where they are allocated elsewhere. And the reason we've got this contorted system is because we rely on the property tax to fund our schools. Property tax is roughly 56, 58 percent of state tax revenues. Completely antiquated system. And the reason we're doing that is nobody wants a state income tax here. But so I, I would say we have a huge issue in moving from the property tax, which taxes ownership, doesn't ta tax the effective movement of goods and services or, or assets, and move more towards a sales tax of some sort, enhanced, which taxes voluntary choice of spending money. We need to move to that, and the sooner the better. Yeah, right. Got time for one more question. Uh, I, I, we'll take two. Okay, uh, let's take your question and then yours, uh, both in succession. Then we'll let our panelists wrap up. Okay. Good. I'm also one of the next generation scholars and a recruiter for Teach for America at UT. Good for you, Wendy Cop, who I graduated from Highland Park with, is the founder, as you know. Yeah, I, yeah. She's going to be at UT in February. Is she? Yeah, I gra She was valedictorian in my class at Highland Park. I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> One of the issues on education in terms of the cultural issue is that we're seeing especially a lot of black and brown boys pushed out of education and into the prison system, um, a phenomenon that's called the school to prison pipeline. This seems like the what prison pipeline? The school to prison pipeline. It seems to be something that needs to be addressed in Texas, especially if we expect to educate Latinos more and, and African Americans more. Um, do you all have any thoughts? on um, this particular issue and how Texas can decrease its incarcerated population. Okay, and Jason, your question. Yes, uh, my name is Jason Brooks. I'm a, a graduate student at the LBJ School of Public Affairs. And I, so I have a question about a topic that you brought up earlier, George, that we haven't given any attention, but that's water in the state. So in, two, in the spring of 2010, I went to a conference in Dallas hosted by Senator Kip Averitt and his uh, Committee on Natural Resources here in Texas. And uh, it seemed like all we talked about was water as an issue in Texas, something that is going to be a problem, especially with our, our coming developments in the energy industry here. And in the fall of 2011, fall of 2012, um, Chris Porter, Texas Road Commissioner, came to UT, talked to an energy symposium about the Eagle Ford Shale developments and the water resource constraints in the Wilcox Aquifer. He said one more year of drought like we had in 2011 would basically leave us buying for the energy industry or people's drinking water in South Texas. I'm, I'm curious if this, if there has been any progress in this discussion that you've seen as you travel around Texas, whether we're talking about solutions to this problem now or whether we're just talking about the problem. Okay, can so I, we've got school to prisons and water. Can I, can I take water first and then you hammer that in water? Okay. So um, there, it's all. How about water in prisons? And then you can, okay. Well, I, I'd really, really rather hear what he thinks about okay. solutions to prisons. Um, I, I, I think it's a problem across races and ethnicities, but it, but, it, but it is more prevalent in certain areas of the state and certain ethnicities. Water. Um, we just talk about it. It's all talk. And, and Bush got a really comprehensive, wise water plan passed in 97, and then they never funded it. What a gutless thing to never fund a 40, 50 year water plan that would take care of a lot of this. And most, as most of y'all know, you divide the state right down the middle, and you go east, and it's lush, and there's water everywhere, and you go west, and it's just dry as a bone. So it, it's a very bifurcated state from that standpoint. I think Joe Strauss may take some leadership on that issue in this session. He is a very, very fine person and very bright, and he's under siege from the far right of my party, but he, he, is, a, he is a public policy servant of the state of Texas, and he know, he's all over this issue. I'm not optimistic something's going to get done because nobody wants to spend money on anything. And back to the, the, uh, the, uh, the sort of Damocles hanging over your head, so to speak, in terms of what you fund, if you take money for a water plant, you've got to take it from somewhere else. You got to restructure how we spend money on healthcare, healthcare, which is why a lot of people want an interstate compact where states have more control over their healthcare spending and make those decisions here, which I'm very much for. 
education, you're going to starve some elements of education if you do this, because those are the two big buckets of state funding. Roads, where are you going to pull this money from? And that's where it takes leadership to figure out, how are we going to cut up this pie? Because the pie is this size. And you can't slice a bigger piece of pie for water and then think you've got still plenty left in the rest of the pie. It's just one pie. So, mm. Whenever I think of water issues, I think of the book Cadillac Desert. So for those of you who haven't read it, I highly recommend it. Um, in terms of the prison issue, we know that there are more black and brown men in prison than there are in college. And this is an issue across the nation. Uh, multiple causes to this. Uh, some of those, many of those internal in the family structures, but also I think there is uh, the professionalization of, of criminals. So my fear is that when you have penal codes that are too aggressive, that you'll take offenses or, or you'll take young kids who maybe you know committed a stupid crime and you harden them. So it's it's that school of prisons that worries me. And you know, for folks like you, especially many of you in the LBJ Public Policy School, to think about solutions to this, but it is something that um, continues to grow and, and regrettably has not abated. Two, two quick follow-ups on that. First of all, one thing I am very proud of about the Texas Public Policy Foundation is they initiated a project to try to get people out of prison earlier who committed nonviolent crimes and are viewed as not a threat to society. And that's been highly successful at not having a recidivism problem once those folks get out of the prison system, as long as it's nonviolent offenders who've done something stupid and deserve another chance. So I'm, I'm proud of that. Secondly, I think you got to go to the core of the issue, like Vicki said, and look at, um, it, and this is a, a bigger issue, but Years ago, the uh, out of out of birth uh, out of wedlock birth rate among African Americans s s soared up over 60 percent, and I'm embarrassed to say that Anglo's and other races were kind of smug about that. Like, oh, we're not as you know having this problem, and our our birth rates are are, are within marriage for the most part. What a arrogant, uh, divisive. Uh, viewpoint on something like that, but the truth is now, the African American out of wedlock birth rate is close to 70 percent, but the Anglo, Hispanic, and other races out of wedlock birth rate is over 40 percent now. So it's not like other ethnic groups or races have have better results there. We're catching up. <laughs> it, it is a societal epidemic, and it's statistically infallible that if you have children that have a single parent household or are born out of wedlock, they're just much more likely to get into crime and drugs and, and all sorts of other uh, counterproductive behavior. And I think you've got to start working on the family unit and societal structure if you're going to get at the core of that problem. All right, well, uh, please join me in thanking our two panelists for a wonderful kickoff today.